This is the BBC Home Service. Hello, children. Children's Hour today starts with a nursery sing-song from the north of England, introduced by Trevor Hill, and then I'll be reading you Oscar Wilde's story of the selfish giant, and we finish with an episode from The Wind and the Willows by Kenneth Graham. But now here's Trevor to introduce the first part of the programme. Hello, children, especially all our very young listeners, because we have nursery sing-song. <laughs> This week we have Vi with us. Now, I wonder how many of you have birthdays today? Well, no doubt we'll find a few if Dennis, our postman, comes along. But I know one person who had a birthday. I'm afraid it's rather wet outside just now. In fact, it looks as if we're in for the type of evening Irene Thompson and David have written about in this song. I like the town on rainy nights when everything is wet. When But as soon as the rain clears up, well, then we can have a game. Perhaps a game with a bouncing ball. There were ten little houses all in a row. And don't you forget that I told you so. Bobby, who lived at number one, started bouncing a ball for fun. Bouncing. 
boasted high as children do into the garden of number two where a couple of ladies drinking tea threw them all away into number three the gardener found it and knocked at the door of the people who lived there number four nobody in they've gone for a drive so he took them all around too number five the maid when he'd gone said it's one of his tricks threw it at once into number six a gentleman was standing there gazing into heaven and to bounce off his nose into number seven number seven got very irate and broke a window of number eight who posted it off in a parcel and twine with a nasty little letter for number nine the postman absent-mindedly then delivered the ball to number ten well i think there is really no need to repeat that there were no other houses that side of the street ain't that sweet ain't that sweet hey nonny nonny no tweet 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 Dennis, our nursery sings up for postman. Are you afraid again, Dennis? Oh, yes, Miss Carson. Oh, I like saying Miss Carson. Do you? Oh, season asses always makes me whistle. <laughs> oh, so I've noticed. Uh, 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 I was saying, man, oh, I'm afraid I can't stop this week. Oh, why? Busy in the garden? I expect he is, by. Oh, no, sir. It's too wet for gardening. The truth is, I've lost a postcard. Oh, dear. Uh, one what was sent to sing song. Oh. oh, however, here are the requests for today. Now, I'll be off. Thank you, Dennis. Oh, has anyone seen a postcard, a postcard, a postcard, a postcard, a postcard? Oh, I hope he finds it, Trevor. Oh, never mind, perhaps it'll turn up for next time. Well, let's see what he's left for us today, shall we? Well, first he has some postcards from Juliet Mary, who'll be four on Saturday and her brother David, from Jennifer Ann, who has a birthday next week, Nigel and Deirdre, who both have birthdays tomorrow, and they, I would like you to sing Little Polly Flinders. Well, I don't blame her wanting to be near the fire today, do you? Little Polly Flinders sat among the cinders, warming her pretty little toes. Her mother came and caught her and whipped her Next time Polly sits by the flat fire, I hope she'll put an apron on. Now a request for Clive, who has whooping cough. Oh dear, we hope you're getting better, Clive. For Keith, who was five last week. Rosemary and Michael, who both have birthdays today. Happy birthday, Rosemary and Michael. Also, Caroline and Cecilia, who I'm afraid both asked for this song rather a long time ago. Anyway, here it is for you now. Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. <laughs> Johnson Station up Alaska way For the strangest animal walked through the woods one day Right there and then he took a pen and wrote the folks a note They chuckled when they got the news For this is what he wrote Quote <laughs> Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't fuzzy. <laughs> fuzzy. Fuzzy Wuzzy lost his crop in the North Pole Barber's shop. Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't fuzzy. <laughs> wuzzy. They say that all the seals in Hudson Bay envy Fuzzy's fuzz. But when they cut his rug away, he wasn't what he used to. Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair. Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't fuzzy. Wuzzy. Huh? Wuzzy? <laughs> and now something for little Esther and Mary. I hope they're listening. For Rosemary Ann and Eileen, who both have birthdays next Monday. Also for Lynn and, I'm sorry, for Anne and Lynette who asked for this song some time ago, and they'd like to hear My Boy Willie. 
and very nice too. Oh, where have you been all the day, my boy Willie? Oh, where have you been all the day? Willie, won't you tell me now? I've been all the day courting of a lady gay, but she is too young to be taken from her mammy. She can brew, she can bake, she can make a wedding cake, but she is too young to be taken from her mammy. Oh, can she knit and can she spin, my boy Willie? Oh, can she knit and can she spin? Willie, won't you tell me now? She can knit, she can spin, she can do most anything, but taken from her mammy. Oh, how old is she now, my boy Willie? Oh, how old is she now? Willie, won't you tell me now? Twice six, twice seven, twice twenty and eleven. But she is too young to be taken from her mammy. That brings us to our last request, Vi, which is for Jennifer Ann, Susan, Timothy, Valerie, Janice, Roger, Barbara, Pamela, Celia, and many, many other children who've asked for this particular song, but I'm afraid if I mentioned all your names, well, it would soon be six o'clock. <laughs> anyway, for all of you, Vi is now going to sing The Teddy Bear's Picnic. <laughs> Trevor and Vi. And now here's our story. It's a bit sad, but I think you'll like it. It's Oscar Wilde's story of the selfish giant. Every afternoon, as they were coming from school, the children used to go and play in the giant's garden. It was a large, lovely garden with soft green grass, and here and there over the grass stood beautiful flowers like stars, and there were twelve peach trees that in the springtime broke out into delicate blossoms of pink and pearl and in the autumn bore rich fruit. The birds sat on the trees and sang so sweetly that the children used to stop their games in order to listen to them. How happy we are here, they cried to each other. One day the giant came back. He had been to visit his friend, the Cornish ogre, and had stayed with him for seven years. After the seven years were over, he had said all that he had to say, for his conversation was limited. 
and he determined to return to his own castle. When he arrived, he saw the children playing in the garden. What are you doing here? he cried in a very gruff voice. And the children ran away. My own garden is my own garden, said the giant. Anyone can understand that, and I will allow nobody to play in it but myself. So he built a high wall all round it and put up a notice board, Trespassers will be prosecuted. He was a very selfish giant. The poor children had now nowhere to play. They tried to play on the road, but the road was very dusty and full of hard stones, and they did not like it. They used to wander round the high walls when their lessons were over and talk about the beautiful garden inside. How happy we were there, they said to each other. Then the spring came, and all over the country there were little blossoms and little birds. Only in the garden of the selfish giant it was still winter. The birds did not care to sing in it, as there were no children, and the trees forgot to blossom. Once a beautiful flower put its head out from the grass, but when it saw the notice board it was so sorry for the children that it slipped back into the ground again and went off to sleep. The only people who were pleased were the snow and the frost. Spring has forgotten this garden, they cried, so we will live here all the year round. The snow covered up the grass with her great white cloak, and the frost painted all the trees silver. Then they invited the north wind to stay with them, and he came. He was wrapped in furs, and he roared all day about the garden and blew the chimney pots down. This is a delightful spot, he said. We must ask the hail on a visit. So the hail came. Every day for three hours he rattled on the roof of the castle, till he broke most of the slates, and then he ran round and round the garden as fast as he could go. He was dressed in grey, and his breath was like ice. I cannot understand why the spring is so late in coming, said the selfish giant, as he sat at the window and looked out at his cold white garden. I hope there will be a change in the weather. But the spring never came, nor the summer. The autumn gave golden fruit to every garden, but to the giant's garden she gave none. He is too selfish, she said. So it was always winter there, and the north wind and the hail and the frost and the snow danced about through the trees. One morning the giant was lying awake in bed when he heard some lovely music. It sounded so sweet to his ears that he thought it must be the king's musicians passing by. It was really only a little linnet singing outside his window, but it was so long since he had heard a bird sing in his garden that it seemed to him to be the most beautiful music in the world. Then the hail stopped dancing over his head, and the north wind ceased roaring, and a delicious perfume came to him through the open casement. I believe the spring has come at last, said the giant. And he jumped out of bed and looked out. What did he see? He saw a most wonderful sight. Through a little hole in the wall, the children had crept in and they were sitting in the branches of the trees. In every tree that he could see, there was a little child. And the trees were so glad to have the children back again that they had covered themselves with blossoms and were waving their arms gently above the children's heads. The birds were flying about and twittering with delight, and the flowers were looking up through the green grass and laughing. It was a lovely scene. Only in one corner it was still winter. It was the farthest corner of the garden, and in it was standing a little boy. He was so small that he could not reach up to the branches of the tree and he was wandering all round it, crying bitterly. The poor tree was still covered with frost and snow, and the north wind was blowing and roaring above it. Climb up, little boy, said the tree, and it bent its branches down as low as it could, but the boy was too tiny, and the giant's heart melted as he looked out. 
Ah, how selfish I've been, he said. Now I know why the spring would not come here. I will put that poor little boy on the top of the tree, and then I will knock down the wall, and my garden shall be the children's playground forever and ever. He was really very sorry for what he had done. So he crept downstairs and opened the front door quite softly and went out into the garden. But when the children saw him, they were so frightened that they all ran away, and the garden became winter again. Only the little boy did not run, for his eyes were so full of tears that he did not see the giant coming. And the giant stole up behind him and took him gently in his hand and put him up into the tree. And the tree broke at once into blossom, and the birds came and sang on it, and the little boy stretched out his two arms and flung them round the giant's neck and kissed him. And the other children, when they saw that the giant was not wicked any longer, came running back, and with them came the spring. It's your garden now, little children, said the giant. And he took a great axe and knocked down the wall. And when the people were going to market at twelve o'clock, they found the giant playing with the children in the most beautiful garden they had ever seen. All day long they played, and in the evening they came to the giant to bid him goodbye. But uh, where is your little companion, he said. The boy I, I put into the tree. The giant loved him the best because he had kissed him. We don't know, answered the children. He's gone away. You must tell him to be sure and come tomorrow, said the giant. But the children said that they did not know where he lived and had never seen him before. And the giant felt very sad. Every afternoon when school was over, the children came and played with the giant, but the little boy whom the giant loved was never seen again. The giant was very kind to all the children, yet he longed for his first little friend and often spoke of him. Uh, how I would like to see him, he used to say. Years went over, and the giant grew very old and feeble. He could not play about any more, so he sat in a huge armchair and watched the children at their games, and admired his garden. Uh, I have many beautiful flowers, he said, but the children are the most beautiful flowers of all. One winter morning, he looked out of his window as he was dressing. He did not hate the winter now, for he knew that it was merely the spring asleep, and that the flowers were resting. Suddenly, he rubbed his eyes in wonder and looked and looked. It certainly was a marvellous sight. In the farthest corner of the garden was a tree quite covered with lovely white blossoms. Its branches were golden and silver fruit hung down from them and underneath it stood the little boy he had loved. Downstairs ran the giant in great joy and out into the garden. He hastened across the grass and came near to the child. And when he came quite close, his face grew red with anger, and he said, Who hath dared to wound thee? For on the palms of the child's hands were the prints of two nails, and the prints of two nails were on the little feet. Who hath dared to wound thee? cried the giant. Tell me that I may take my big sword and slay him. Nay, answered the child, but these are the wounds of love. Who art thou, said the giant, and a strange awe fell on him, and he knelt before the little child. And the child smiled on the giant and said to him, you let me play once in your garden. Today you shall come with me to my garden, which is paradise. And when the children ran in that afternoon, they found the giant lying dead 
under the tree, all covered with white blossoms. We come now to a story from The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. Norman Shelley plays Toad in Toad's Adventure. Toad found himself shut in a dank and noisome dungeon and knew that all the grim darkness of a medieval fortress lay between him and the outer world of sunshine and high roads where he had lately been so happy. He flung himself at full length on the floor, shed bitter tears and abandoned himself to dark despair. <laughs> oh, this is the end of everything. At least it is the end of the career of Toad, which is the same thing. The popular and handsome Toad. The rich and hospitable Toad. The Toad so free and careless and debonair. How could I hope to be ever set at large again? Who have been imprisoned so justly for stealing so handsome a motor car? in such an audacious manner, and with such dreadful cheek, bestowed upon such a number of fat, red-faced policemen. Stupid animal that I was. Now I must languish in this dungeon till people who are proud to say they knew me have forgotten the very name of Toad. Oh, wise old badger. Oh, clever rat. And sensible mole. What sound judgments. What a knowledge of men and matters you possess. Oh, unhappy and forsaken toad. With lamentations such as these, he passed his days and nights for several weeks, refusing his meals. Though the grim and ancient jailer, knowing the toad's pockets were well lined, frequently pointed out that many comforts and indeed luxuries could be sent in at a price from outside. Now, the jailer had a daughter, a pleasant girl and good-hearted, who assisted her father in the lighter duties of his post. She was particularly fond of animals, and besides her canary, she kept piebald mice and a squirrel. This kind-hearted girl, pitying the misery of Toad, said to her father one day, Father, I can't bear to see that poor beast so unhappy and getting so thin. You let me have the managing of him. You know how fond of animals I am. I'll make him eat from my hand and sit up and do all sorts of things. Her father replied that she could do what she liked with him. 
He was tired of Toad and his socks and his airs and his meanness. So that day, she went on her errand of mercy to Toad's cell. Now, cheer up, Toad, and sit up and dry your eyes and be a sensible animal. And do try and eat a bit of dinner. See, I brought you some of mine, hot from the oven. It was bubble and squeak between two plates, and its fragrance filled the narrow cell. The smell of cabbage reached the nose of Toad as he lay in his misery on the floor and gave him the idea for the moment that perhaps life was not such a blank and desperate thing as he imagined. But still he wailed and kicked with his legs and refused to be comforted. So the wise girl retired for the time. But of course a, a good deal of the smell of hot cabbage remained behind, as it will do. And Toad, between his sobs, sniffed and reflected. And gradually began to think new and inspiring thoughts of chivalry and poetry and deeds still to be done, of broad meadows and cattle, of kitchen gardens and straight herb borders and warm snapdragon beset by bees, and of the comforting clink of dishes set down on the table at Toad Hall. He began to think of his friends and how they would surely be able to do something. And lastly, he thought of his own great cleverness and resource and all that he was capable of if he only gave his great mind to it. And the cure was almost complete. When the girl returned some hours later, she carried a tray with a cup of fragrant tea steaming on it, and a plate piled up with very hot buttered toast, cut thick, very brown on both sides, with the butter running through the holes in it in great golden drops like honey from the honeycomb. The smell of that buttered toast simply talked to Toad, and with no uncertain voice, talked of warm kitchens, of breakfasts on bright frosty mornings, of cosy firesides on winter evenings when one's ramble was over, and slippered feet were propped on the fender, of the purring of contented cats, and the twitter of sleepy canaries. Toad sat up on end once more, dried his eyes, sipped his tea, and munched his toast, and so began talking freely about himself and the house he lived in and his doings there and how important he was and what a lot his friends thought of him. The jailer's daughter saw that the topic was doing him as much good as the tea, as indeed it was and encouraged him to go on. Tell me about Toad Hall. It sounds beautiful. Toad Hall <laughs> is an eligible, self-contained gentleman's residence, very unique, dating in parts from the 14th century, but containing every modern convenience, up-to-date sanitation, five minutes from church, post office, and golf links, suitable oh, for... the animal. I don't want to take it. Tell me something real about it. Oh. So Toad told her about the boathouse and the fish pond and the old walled kitchen garden and about the pigsties and the stable and the pigeon house and the hen house and about the dairy and the wash house and the china cupboards and the linen presses. She liked that bit especially. And about the banqueting hall and the fun they had there when the other animals were gathered round the table and Toad was at his best singing songs telling stories, carrying on generally. Then she wanted to know about his animal friends and was very interested in all he had to tell her about them and how they lived and what they did to pass their time. When she said good night, having filled his water jug and shaken up his straw for him, Toad was very much the same hopeful, self-satisfied animal that he had been of old. He sang a little song or two, the sort he used to sing at his dinner parties, curled himself up in the straw and had an excellent night's rest and the pleasantest of dreams. They had many interesting talks together after that as the dreary days went on, and the jailer's daughter grew very sorry for Toad and thought it a great shame that a poor little animal should be locked up in prison for what seemed to her a very mild offence. 
One morning, the girl was very thoughtful and did not seem to Toad to be paying proper attention to his witty sayings and sparkling comments. Uh, Toad, just listen, please. I have an aunt who is a washerwoman. Yeah, uh, never mind. Think no more about it. I have several aunts who ought to be washerwomen. Do be quiet a minute. You talk too much. That's your chief fault. And I'm trying to think and you hurt my head. Oh. As I said, I have an aunt who is a washerwoman. She does the washing for all the prisoners in the castle. Mm. She takes out the washing on Monday morning yeah. and brings it in on Friday evening. Oh. This is a Thursday. Oh. Now, this is my plan. You're very rich. At least you're always telling me so. Yeah. And she's very poor. A few pounds wouldn't make any difference to you, and it would mean a lot to her. Mm -hmm. Now, I think if you were properly approached, a squared, I believe, is the word you animals use, <laughs> you could come to some arrangement by which she would let you have her dress and bonnet and so on, Oh. and you could escape from the castle as the official washerwoman. Oh. You're very alike in many respects. Particularly about the figure. We're not. I have a very elegant figure. <laughs> for what I am. So has my aunt, for what she is. But have it your own way, you horrid, proud, ungrateful animal, when I'm sorry for you and trying to help you. Yes, 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 that's all right. Thank you very, very much indeed. But look here. Uh, you wouldn't surely have Mr. Toad of Toad Hall going about the country disguised as a washerwoman? Then you can stop here as a toad. I suppose you want to go off in a coach and four. Oh, no, 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 no. You are a, a good, kind, clever girl, and I am indeed a proud and stupid toad. Introduce me to your worthy aunt, if you will be so kind, and I have no doubt that the excellent lady and I will be able to arrange terms satisfactory to both so next evening, the girl ushered her aunt into Toad's cell, bearing his week's washing pinned up in a towel. The old lady had been prepared beforehand for the interview, and the sight of certain golden sovereigns that Toad had thoughtfully placed on the table in full view practically completed the matter and left little further to discuss. In return for his cash, Toad received a cotton print gown, an apron, a shawl, and a rusty black bonnet. The only condition the old lady made being that she should be gagged and bound and dumped down in a corner. By this not very convincing plan, she explained, she hoped to keep her situation in spite of the suspicious appearance of things. Toad was delighted with the suggestion. It would enable him to leave the prison in some style and with his reputation for being a desperate and dangerous fellow untarnished and he readily helped the jailer's daughter to make her aunt appear as much as possible the victim of circumstances over which she had no control. Now it's your turn, Toad. <laughs> Take off that coat and waistcoat of yours. Oh. You're fat enough as it is. Shaking with laughter, she proceeded to hook and eye Toad into the cotton print gown, arranged the shawl with a professional fold, and tied the strings of the rusty bonnet under his chin. <laughs> Daughter. Only I'm sure you never looked half so respectable in your life before. <laughs> <laughs> now, goodbye, Toad, and good luck. Go straight down the way you came up. And if anyone says anything to you, you can chaff back a bit, of course. <laughs> With a quaking heart, but as firm a footstep as he could command, Toad set forth cautiously on what seemed to be a most harebrained and dangerous undertaking. But he was soon agreeably surprised to find how easy everything was made for him. The washerwoman's squat figure in its familiar cotton print seemed a passport for every barred door and grim gateway. Even when he hesitated, uncertain as to the right turning to take, he found himself helped out of his difficulty by the warder at the next gate, anxious to be off to his tea, summoning him to come along sharp and not keep him waiting there all night. It seemed hours before he crossed the last courtyard, but at length he heard the wicked gate in the great outer door click behind him, felt the fresh air of the outer world upon his anxious brow, and knew that he was free. Dizzy with the easy success of his daring exploit, he walked quickly towards the lights of the town, not knowing in the least what he should do next, only quite certain of one thing, that he must remove himself as quickly as possible 
from a neighborhood where the lady he was forced to represent was so well known. As Toad walked along, his attention was caught by some red and green lights a little way off to one side of the town, and the sound of the puffing and snorting of engines and the banging of shunted trucks fell on his ear. Ah, this is a piece of luck. A railway station is the thing I want most in the whole world at this moment. And what's more, I needn't go through the town to get it. He made his way to the station, consulted a timetable, and found that a train bound more or less in the direction of his home was due to start in half an hour. Ah, is he Toadville Junction? Yes. Oh, yes, more luck. And he went off to the booking office to buy his ticket. He gave the name of the station that he knew to be nearest to the village of which Toad Hall was the principal feature. But as he mechanically put his fingers in search of the necessary money where his waistcoat pocket should have been, he found not only no money, but no pocket to hold it, and no waistcoat to hold the pocket. To his horror, he remembered that he had left both coat and waistcoat behind him in his cell. And with them, his pocketbook, money, keys, watch, matches, pencil case, all that makes life worth living, all that distinguishes the many-pocketed animal, the lord of creation, from the inferior one-pocketed or no-pocketed creature. In his misery, he made one desperate effort to carry the thing off, and with a return to his fine old manner, a blend of the squire and the college don, he said, uh, look here. I find I've left my purse behind. Just give me that ticket, will you? And I'll send the money on tomorrow. I'm well known in these parts. The clerk stared at him and the rusty black bonnet a moment and then laughed, simply saying, Oh, I should think you were pretty well known in these parts if you tried to scheme on often. What? Here, stand away from the window, please, madam. You're obstructing the other passengers. Oh. An old gentleman who had been prodding Toad in the back for some moments here thrust him away, which angered Toad more than anything that occurred that evening. Baffled and full of despair, he wandered blindly down the platform where the train was standing, and tears trickled down each side of his nose. What was to be done? He was not swift of foot. His figure was unfortunately recognizable. Could he not squeeze under the seat of a carriage? As he pondered, he found himself opposite the engine, which was being oiled, wiped, and generally caressed by its affectionate driver, a burly man with an oil can in one hand and a lump of cotton waste in the other. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, Mother. Uh, what's the trouble? You don't look particularly cheerful. Oh, sir. I'm a poor, unhappy washerwoman, and I've lost all my money and can't pay for a ticket. And I must get home tonight somehow, and whatever I am to do, I don't know. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, no, that's a bad business indeed. Lost your money and can't get home. And got some kids, too, waiting for you, I dare say. Oh, any amount of them. <laughs> And they'll be hungry and playing with the matches and upsetting lamps, the little innocents. And quarrelling and going on generally. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, no, well, now, I, I tell you what I'll do. You're a washerwoman to your trade, says you. <laughs> Very well. That's that. And I'm an engine driver, as you may well see. I do. And there's no denying it's terrible dirty work. Filthy. Uses a power of shirts, it does, till me missus is fair tired of washing of them. Yes. If you'll wash a few shirts for me when you get home and send them along, sure I'll give you a ride in the engine. Oh! The toad's oh. misery turned into rapture as he eagerly scrambled up into the cab of the engine. Of course, he'd never washed a shirt in his life and couldn't if he'd tried. And anyhow, he wasn't going to begin. But he thought, when I get safely home to Toad Hall and have money again and pockets to put it in, I will send the engine driver enough to pay for quite a quantity of washing. And that will be the same thing. Or better. The guard waved his flag, the engine driver blew the whistle, and the train moved out of the station. As the speed increased, and the toad could see on either side of him real friends and trees and hedges and cows and horses all flying past him 
And as he thought now, every minute was bringing him nearer to Toad Hall and sympathetic friends and money to chink in his pocket and a soft bed to sleep in and good things to eat and praise and admiration of the recital of his adventures and his surpassing cleverness. He began to skip up and down and shout and sing snatches of song to the great astonishment of the engine driver who had come across washerwomen before but never one at all like this. They had covered many and many a mile and Toad was already considering what he would have for supper when he got home. When he noticed that the engine driver with a puzzled expression on his face, was leaning over the side of the engine and listening. Oh, that was very strange. We're the last train running in this direction tonight. Yet I could be sworn that I heard another following us. Toad ceased his antics at once. Mm -hmm. He became grave and depressed, and a dull pain in the lower part of his spine, communicating itself to his legs, made him want to sit down and try not to think of all the possibilities. By this time, the moon was shining brightly, and the engine driver, steadying himself on the coal, could command a view of the line behind them for a long distance. Oh, you can see it clearly now. Uh -huh. It is an engine on our rails, coming along at a great pace. Oh. It looks as if we were being pursued. The miserable toad, crouching in the coal dust, tried hard to think of something to do with dismal want of success. Oh, they'll gain it not as fast. And the engine is crowded with the queerest lot of people. Men like warders, policemen in their helmets, oh. waving truncheons, and shabbily dressed men in pot hats, waving revolvers and walking sticks, all waving, and all shouting the same thing. Stop, stop, stop! Toad fell on his knees then among the coals and raising his clasped paws in supplication, cried, Save me, only save me, dear, kind Mr. Engine Driver. Ooh! And I will confess everything. I am not the simple washerwoman I seem to be. I have no children waiting for me, innocent or otherwise. I am a toad, the well-known and popular Mr. Toad. I have just escaped by my great daring and cleverness from a loathsome dungeon into which my enemies had flung me. And if those fellows on that engine recapture me, it will be chains and bread and water and straw and misery once more for poor unhappy innocent toad. Now tell the truth. What were you put in prison for? <laughs> it was nothing very much. I only <laughs> borrowed a motor car while the owners were at lunch. They had no need of it at the time. I didn't mean to steal it, really. But people especially magistrates, take such harsh views of thoughtless and high-spirited action. Oh, I fear that you've been indeed a wicked toad. And by rights I ought to give you up. Oh, but you're evidently in sore trouble and distress, so he'll not desert you. Oh. I don't hold with motor cars, for one thing. But I don't hold with being ordered about by policemen when I'm on my own engine for another. No sight of an animal in tears always makes me feel <laughs> queer and soft-hearted. <laughs> so, so cheer up, Toad. I'll do my best and we may beat them yet. Right, shovel! They Ooh. piled on more coal, shoveling furiously. The furnace roared, the sparks flew, the engine leapt and swung. But still, their pursuers slowly gained. Oh, I'm afraid it's no good, Toad. You see, they're running light and they have the better engine. Oh, there's just one thing left for us to do, so attend very carefully to what I tell you. Yes, and this... A short way ahead of us is a long tunnel, yes. and on the other side of that, the line passes through a thick wood. Yes. Now, I'll put on all the speed I can while we are running through the tunnel. Mm -hmm. But the other fellows will slow down a bit, naturally, for fear of an accident. <laughs> now, when we're through, I will shut off the steam and put on brakes as hard as I can. And the moment it's safe to do so, you must jump and hide in the wood before they get through the tunnel and see you. Ah, then I'll go full speed ahead again. And they can chase me if they like for as long as they like and as far as they like. Now, mind and be ready to jump when I tell you. They piled on more coals, 
And the train shot into the tunnel and the engine rushed and roared and rattled till at last they shot out the other end into fresh air and the peaceful moonlight and saw the wood lying dark and hopeful upon either side of the line. The driver shut off steam and put on brakes. The toad got down on the step and as the train slowed down to almost a walking pace, he heard the driver call out, No! Jump! Thank you. Toad jumped, rolled down a short embankment, picked himself up unhurt, scrambled into the wood and hid. Peeping out, he saw his train get up speed again and disappear at a great pace. Then, out of the tunnel burst the pursuing engine, roaring and whistling, her motley crew waving their various weapons and shouting, Stop! 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 When they were past, the toad had a hearty laugh for the first time since he was thrown into prison. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. He soon stopped laughing suddenly when he came to consider that it was now very late and dark and cold. And he was in an unknown wood with no money and no chance of supper and still far from friends and home, and the dead silence of everything after the roar and rattle of the train was something of a shock. He dared not leave the shelter of the trees, so he struck into the wood with the idea of leaving the railway as far as possible behind him. After so many weeks within walls, he found the wood strange and unfriendly, and inclined, he thought, to make fun of him. Night jars sounding their mechanical rattle made him think that the wood was full of searching warders closing in on him. An owl swooping noiselessly towards him brushed his shoulder with its wing, making him jump with the horrid certainty that it was a hand, then flitted off moth-like. Once he met a fox, who stopped, looked him up and down in a sarcastic sort of way and said, Hello, washerwoman. Oh, good uh, evening. Half a pair of socks and a pillowcase short this week. Mind it doesn't occur again. <laughs> and the fox swaggered off, sniggering. Toad looked about for a stone to throw at him, but could not succeed in finding one which vexed him more than anything. At last, cold and hungry and tired out, he sought the shelter of a hollow tree, where, with branches and dead leaves, he made himself as comfortable a bed as he could and slept soundly till the morning. You've been listening to Toad's Adventure, part of The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. And that brings children's hour to an end for today. So from me, David, good night, children. Good night.
square is one of the most important places in Toy Town, and right in the center upon a tall pedestal stands the statue of the mayor of Toy Town. Now this statue was one of the first things to catch the eye of Ernest the policeman each morning as he crossed the square on his way to the town hall. But one morning as he entered the square, he paused in astonishment and stared hard at the statue, for it had been painted bright green. As Ernest stood there, a little bleating voice spoke at his elbow. Oh, 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 Mr. Ernest, sir, you, you do look funny this morning. Your eyes are all goggly. So would you look goggly, Larry, my lad, if you could see what I see? Can you? Or do my eyes deceive me? Well, I don't know, Mr. Ernest, sir. What can you see? I can see a most dreadful sight, something I never expected to see. I wonder my eyes don't pop right out. Oh! Uh, that reminds me. Did you know that if you hold a guinea pig up by its tail, its eyes will drop out? My friend Dennis told me last night. Uh, isn't it curious? I'm not a-talking about guinea pigs, my lad. I'm a-talking about something much more curious. Oh. Now, take a good look at the statue of his worship over there and tell me what you can see. Oh, Mr. Ernest, sir. Why, it turned green, a pretty grass colour. Turn green? It's been painted green, that's what's the matter with that. Now you keep away from it, Larry, my lad. Uh, green paint. And still wet. This'll be a great upset for the mayor. He thought a lot of that statue he did. At that moment, there trotted into the square the long, low figure of Dennis the Dachshund. He sniffed the cobblestones as he came along and presently stopped beside Ernest and Larry and looked up at the statue. Then he blinked his eyes rapidly and looked again. Ah, you may well blink, Dennis, my lad. It's not often you see a sight like that, I'll be bound. That's paint, that is. Green paint. And what the mayor will say, I don't know. So, green paint also on the cobblestones there is. Why, so there is. That's the best of being so low on the ground like you. I should never notice that. <laughs> a trail it is. A trail of paint out of the square leading. Ah, you're a clever hound. It does. The criminal must have spilled his paint as he left the scene of the crime. And what we got to do is to follow that trail. It will us to the criminal lead, was it? Yes, it was. It is. Well, why don't you speak grammatical? You muddle me all up. Oh, please, Mr. Ernest, uh, is the paint what you call a clue? Dennis was telling me about clues last night. He was reading me a most awfully exciting detective story called The Black Paw, and it was all about... I ain't no time to listen to detective stories now, me lad. I'm a going to be a detective. I'm a going to follow the tracks of the criminals. Dennis, you being so low-built and accustomed to sniffing shall help be leading the way. Oh, yeah. Come along, me lads. Slowly they passed across the square... Dennis in front, smelling out the occasional splashes of the paint, Ernest following in a crouching posture, notebook in hand, and Larry behind walking cautiously on the tips of his hoofs as he thought a detective should walk. The trail of paint led out of the square into Ark Street and then suddenly ceased before the house of Mr. Grouser. And against the house of Mr. Grouser was popped a ladder upon which Mr. Grouser himself was standing. He was in his shirt sleeves. A pot of paint hung from a rung of the ladder and he was engaged in painting the shutters of one of his windows. And the paint he was using was bright green. Aha! Oh, my! So, it is perhaps the criminal, was it? I should say it was. Is, I mean. I do wish you wouldn't talk so silly. Hey, you up there, Mr. Grouse, sir. Well, what is it, what is it? Can't you let me alone to paint my house in peace without shouting and yelling at me like that it ought not to be allowed? No, Mr. Grocer, sir. Come down off that ladder and answer me questions. Oh, very well. And answer oh, careful, because what you say will be took down and used in evidence against you. Absolutely. Now then, now then, what is all this nonsense, eh, officer? What do you mean by speaking to me in that manner? Me, one of the oldest and most respectable citizens of Toy Town. Old you may be, Mr. Grouser, sir. But respectable? Never. Huh. No respectable citizen would go so far as to forget himself and paint the statue of his worship, the mayor, and paint it green of all colors. Paint? 
statue of the mayor? You're talking nonsense, officer. I wonder you're not ashamed. Do you think I would waste expensive green paint on that statue of the mayor? The statue has been painted a bright and disrespectful color to wit green. <laughs> What you might call a trail, or in other words, some blobs and splashes of the said paint lead directly to your door, Mr. Grouse, sir. And I find you with a pot of the same identical paint and with the evidence of your crime all over your hands and even running up your sleeves. It was so. He was the criminal. It was a disgrace. Send that low badger hound away. He irritates me. Go away. Go away. He has ashamed us in the face to look, Larry, my friend. It was not surprising. Go, let us come. No, <laughs> As for you, Constable, I suppose you think I am the only person in Toy Town who possesses green paint. And let me tell you that I purchased this paint from the inventor, and as the tin leaked, it is very likely that it left a trail across the square. And if you go and look, you will probably notice that the trail keeps on back to the inventor's workshop. Oh. Ah, oh, indeed. And when you have found that out, I shall expect you to come back here and apologize to me. It's disgraceful. You, an officer of the law, suggesting such things. Go away, go away. Very well, Mr. Grouse, sir. I will go and continue me work of detection. And if you are innocent of this crime, you have nothing to fear. But I may say that I am not yet satisfied. And I shall put you down in me notebook as a suspicious character. Ernest turned on his heel and followed Dennis and Larry, who had been listening at the corner, into the square. Oh, uh, Mr. Ernest, uh, Mr. Grouse was quite right. The paint does go right across the square. Dennis found it quite easily. Ah, indeed. And it looks as if Mr. Grouse may have been innocent after all. But before I decide, we will follow this end of the trail and see where it leads us. They did, and the trail of green paint led them directly to the entrance to the inventor's workshop. The inventor was at home and at work. And as Ernest and his companions entered the workshop, the inventor laid down the hammer with which he had been pounding a sheet of tin and looked up with surprise. Oh, ah, good morning, officer. Mm, uh, you're out very early this morning. Mm? Um, uh, have you come to see my new sausage machine by any chance? Mm? Sausage machine? Yes, yes, a machine for making sausages. It's quite a new idea of mine. I finished it yesterday. Uh, uh, this is it. The inventor led them to a very complicated-looking apparatus standing against the wall. Ernest looked at it and then stared hard at the inventor. Then he looked at Larry and Dennis and gave a knowing cough. <clears throat> I see uh, you've painted it green, Mr. Inventor, sir? Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's uh, really a very useful appliance, officer. Mm? Uh, you see, you put the meat stuff in this end and then turn the handle attached to this wheel mm? and uh, after a time, sausages begin to come out of the other end. Mm? Uh, yes, uh, really most useful. Uh, and the only trouble is that turning the wheel is rather tiring. Mm? I saw the fitting clockwork, but then one would have to be constantly winding up the spring, hmm? Oh, oh if you please, sir, I have an idea. Why don't you fit a wheel to it like the one Dennis works? My friend Dennis is a turnspit by trade. I often watch him working his wheel. I expect he'd come and work one for you, if you gave him some pocket money. What did you say he was? A water? No, sir, a turnspit. He gets into a wheel and works his legs just as if he was walking, and that makes the wheel go round. It's great fun. You've no idea how fast he can make the wheel go. And when the wheel goes round, it turns the thing in front of the fire with a piece of meat on it so that the meat gets nicely roasted all over. Dennis is awfully clever at turning things. You ought to see him. I suppose that's what's made him so shocking bandy. Ah, you was rude, officer, very rude. You'll excuse me, Mr. Inventor, sir, but I didn't come here to talk about turning wheels nor yet about sausages. I remarked, when this lamb broke in with his chatter, that you painted your machine green. Yes, well, well uh, why not, officer? Hmm? Uh, why not? Uh, green is a nice, cheerful colour. Hmm? A very nice colour for painting a sausage machine, no doubt. 
But be no means nice for painting other things I could name. Sitch as the statue of his worship, for example. Yes, I, uh, I quite agree that it is hardly suitable for that. Hmm? Um, it would be rather disrespectful, perhaps, to uh, to paint the mayor's statue in any colour. Hmm? Ah, then let me tell you, Mr. Inventor, sir, that last night between supper time and breakfast, somebody, somebody painted the statue of his worship a bright green. Hmm? And what is more, the identical green you got there. And what I should like to know is, what were you were doing last night between the times mentioned? Uh, well, uh, really, officer, you can hardly suggest that I painted the mayor's statue when I had such an interesting thing as a sausage machine to paint, hmm? uh, And as a matter of fact, I've sold quite a lot of this paint. Uh, and, uh, I've made much more than I wanted. Uh, I, I sold a tin to Mr. Grouser, and I've sold several other tins. Uh -huh. uh, yes, the people I forget. Hmm. Uh, I remember now that I, I took a tin out last evening after tea to deliver to someone. Yes, but I was, uh, I was rather absent-minded, I'm afraid, having so much to think about in connection with this new sausage machine. Hmm. Uh, I put the tin down somewhere and, and forgot it. Hmm. Which means to say you left a tin of paint somewhere for any criminal to get hold of. Uh, yes, I'm afraid so. Uh, and a brush to go with it. Hmm. Uh, but uh, it doesn't follow that anyone who finds a tin of paint must at once paint the nearest statue. Hmm? True, sir. There is something in that. Very well, that amounts to this. You left a tin of paint somewhere in the street last night. Very careless, I calls it, sir. Very careless. Yes, 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 yes. I, I left it somewhere, I know. Hmm. And now I come to think it over. I, I feel sure I left it in the square. Hmm. Um, I remember putting it down while I looked at the mayor's statue. Yes, I was, I was thinking how nice and clean it looked and how light his worship. Hmm. Ah, that is very important evidence. Then at that time, you're certain the statue was not painted? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely certain. Mm. Uh, and that must have been just before supper time. Mm. Uh, I recollect that the sentry who walks up and down in front of the town hall had just come on duty for the night. Mm. Ah, we're now beginning to move. The evidence is coming in fast. I forgot that sentry. I must see him at once. Larry and Dennis, my lads, you run to the square and look for that pot of paint. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And when you found it, come and tell me. I'm a going to see that sentry and find out who come into the square last night. Then I'm a going to the town hall to report this crime to the mayor, because this case is getting a bit too much for me. Larry and his friend Dennis found the pot of paint at once, behind the pedestal on which stood the statue of the mayor. It had been opened, and beside it lay a large, sticky brush. When the mayor learned from Ernest the policeman what had happened to the statue of which he had been so proud, he was extremely angry. But after he had understood how quickly and thoroughly the officer had set about the work of tracking down the criminal, he grew calmer. I'm extremely surprised, officer, that you should permit such a thing to happen. It is your duty to prevent crime. I can hardly believe that any person in Toy Town would deliberately paint my fine statue green. Green of all colours, and most disrespectful. Well, he might have painted it purple with yellow spots, your worship. That would have been even more disrespectful. Well, really. At this moment, there came a tap very low down upon the door, and in walked Dennis and Larry the latter gripping between his hoofs a dripping tin of green paint, which he placed carefully on the carpet. Oh, oh, Mr. Mann, Mr. Ernest, sir, we've found the paint. Look, this is it. It was just behind the statue. Well, you remove it from my carpet. I, I put it in the fireplace. The idea of the new carpet. I don't think it will hurt the carpet, Mr. Mayor, sir. It's a lovely colour, and we found the pot quite easily. You see, after we left you, we remembered that we saw Mr. Inventor last evening carrying a tin. We saw him go into the square, and Dennis said to me... I didn't. You did. You said... That looks like paint, and you turn to look, and then you said he's put it down by the statue. Why didn't you tell me that this morning? Oh, Mr. Anderson, we both forgot. It was so exciting this morning. This is very suspicious, Your Worship. It is. Distinctly suspicious. 
The only thing is that neither of these animals is tall enough to have committed the crime. There he couldn't have reached. Just then, the mayor's secretary opened the door and showed in a soldier who took three paces into the room, saluted and grounded his musket smartly. Ah, <coughs> uh, this is the sentry, Your Worship. Is it? When I heard his report, I told him to come here and tell you. I thought you ought to hear it, Your Worship, because it shows that this year crime's a darker deed than what we thought. Now, my lad, repeat to his Worship what you told me about last night. Last night at 8 p.m., I went on duty for to perform my duties as sentry. <clears throat> it was then a growing dark, when there was a nice bright moon. There was then no one in the square. But at 8.15 Pip Emma, or as near as makes no difference, I saw the inventor into the square carrying some object. He seemed dazed like, as if he'd forgotten Southwick. He put the object down near the statute and then wandered off, dazed like. And a little while after, I saw these two animals, the lamb and that there sausage dog, come into the square. They both went up to the object. Are you referring to my statute? Uh, statue? No, sir. The, the object what proved to be a pot of paint. They stood there talking and I went over to see what they was up to, knowing that animals will be animals, as you might say. Indeed. <laughs> and then they both trotted off and I followed them up and saw them safely out of the square. Then I went back and took another look at the object and also at the statute, which I find a very soothing thing to look at when on duty and nothing to do. <laughs> this appears to be a most intelligent fellow. <laughs> Now, uh, tell me, my man, um, when you looked at the uh, statue, uh, was it green or was it its natural colour? Natural colour, sir. All white and glistening it was. Reminded me of something on top of a Christmas cake. Well, then clearly those two animals had no hand in the affair. Proceed, uh, my man. Sir, all of that, sir, I went back to my sentry box and nothing happened for a long time. And then, suddenly, I saw somebody coming to the square... And on looking careful, like, I swear it was the magician. He walked straight across the square, and I was wondering what he was out so late for her when a most remarkable thing happened. A barrel came rolling after the magician. Rolling? Yeah, rolling. Do you mean the magician was pulling a barrel behind him? No, sir. It was rolling all by itself. You could have knocked me down with a feather. I says to myself, that's magic, that is. Magic. I never did like magic. And when I see that magician walking along with a great barrel, rolling along with him with no visible means of support, as you might say, I says, this ain't right, this ain't. And I come over all groozy. <laughs> in fact, sir, I went into my sentry box and put me head in the corner and stayed there. Poor fellow. And after a bit, I heard the barrel rolling again, and I, I just peeped out. And then it was rolling back the way it had come. And when it got light in the morning, I felt a bit ashamed. And I says, Horace, my lad, that being my name, Horace, you ought to be ashamed of being frightened of a potato barrel. So I took a walk round and then I suddenly noticed the statue to turn green. And that's the truth, sir. Believe me or believe me not. When the sentry had been dismissed, the mayor looked at Ernest and Ernest looked at the mayor, while Larry and Dennis looked at each other. It seems quite clear now, officer, what happened. The magician enchanted or betwixt the statute. Well, uh, anyway, that's why it turned green. I doubt it, your worship. I put my finger on that statue and it was wet paint. Magic ain't sticky like that. Oh, it's a very puzzling affair. I don't know what to think. With the evidence we have, I feel sure we shall be able to detect the criminal. Do you, your worship? Well, this is the evidence. You just listen. Mr. Grocer and the inventor have both had green paint in their possession, and Mr. Grocer's appearance is very suspicious. The inventor is very fond of doing things and is very absent-minded. He may not always know what he is doing. Also, he left a pot of paint in the square. These two animals, Larry and Dennis, knew all about the paint and then forgot it, or so they pretend. And after they'd gone home, the sentry noticed that the statue was all right. And between that time and the morning when the sentry saw the statue was green, nobody come into the square except the magician, evidently doing some sort of magic. What trick he was up to, we don't know. And I'm a bit suspicious of that sentry. Now then, what I want to know is two things, namely one, who was the criminal? Two, how did he do it? 
And perhaps, Your Worship, when you think it over, you can answer those two questions for it's more than I can. Now, listeners, if you have not heard this Toy Town play before, try to work out for yourselves how this mystery was solved. And when we continue after a short musical interlude, you can find out how near you were to guessing the correct solution to the great Toy Town mystery. <laughs> The solution. The mayor of Toy Town had just finished a very good breakfast, for the inventor had sent round a packet of sausages made by his new sausage machine with a request that the mayor would be good enough to try them. And the mayor agreed that they were excellent sausages. And just as he finished eating them, there was a clatter of hoofs, and without even knocking on the door, in rushed Larry the Lamb. He was a pitiable sight. Tears streamed from his little eyes, and for a few moments he could do nothing but sob and wave his front hoofs. Oh! Oh! oh, bleh, oh, oh. Hey, good gracious oh. me, my poor lamb. What is it? What, whatever's the matter? Oh, no, come, come. Pull yourself together and tell me what is the matter. Haven't you a handkerchief? No. There, there. Oh. Oh. Mr. Mayor. Well, now, come, come. Take your time, my poor lamb. Take your time. Oh, Mr. Mayor, sir. Have you had your breakfast yet? Breakfast? Certainly. I've had some excellent sausages which the inventors in there. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> At the word sausages, Larry had broken out afresh into bars and sobs, and neither the mayor nor his secretary could quieten him. They fussed round him with handkerchiefs, and in the middle of the commotion, Ernest the policeman stepped into the room. Ah. Good morning, officer. Do you think you could do anything with this lamb? He seems almost too overcome to speak. Now, come, my poor lamb. What is it? Come, tell Uncle Ernest. Well, I, I mentioned I had partaken of sausages for breakfast, and he immediately began to carry on like this. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, sir, did you eat all the sausages? Uh, yes, certainly, my lamb, and very fine they were. Oh, Mr. Mayor, sir, then, do you know you've eaten my friend Dennis? I, uh, oh, dear. I was just saying what excellent sausages they were. But I don't understand this. Do you mean, Larry Millard, that your friend Dennis got mixed up with the sausage machine? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. He, we think he m fell into it. Now, come, come, perhaps it's not as bad as you think. Uh, try and tell us what happened. Uh, I will, Mr. Mayor, sir. M Mr. Ernest, you, you remember the inventor's sausage machine and how he had to turn a handle to make it work? And you remember I explained that my friend Dennis was a, a turnspit by trade. Indeed. Oh, <laughs> when I explained how Dennis could turn a wheel round with his paws and told the inventor how he could fit a wheel to his sausage machine. Well, he did, and he arranged with Dennis to come and get inside the wheel and turn it every evening for threepence a week. Oh, there. There, there. <laughs> well, last night, sir, we left Dennis turning the wheel of the sausage machine, and the inventor and I went out to buy some more pepper and, and, and stuff, you, you know. But when we came back, there was no sign of Dennis. But in the tray was a, 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 a great pile of sausages. Oh, oh no. And first we thought Dennis had got tired and gone home. So I helped to pack up some of the sausages. And on my way home, I put a packet in your letterbox with a note as the inventor told me. But Dennis didn't come home last night. And when I went to the workshop this morning, the inventor was looking very unhappy, and he said, I'm afraid Dennis fell into the machine last night, and now he's sausages. Oh, dear. <laughs> you see, sir, that machine keeps on working for some time after the wheel stops, and Dennis must have been too, well, in inquisitive. Oh, poor, poor Dennis. He was so clever at turning things, too. He often used to get inside a barrel and roll it about just as if it was his wheel. Oh, 
<laughs> it's very sad. It's uh, most distressing. I... <laughs> well, officer, what are you looking like that for? Why am I looking like this, sir? Why, because I see it all. I've solved the great Toy Town mystery. I see now who painted your statue green and how he done it. It was Dennis the Dachshund. What? Yes, it was him in that magic barrel. That's how he got into the square without being seen. Oh, yes, sir, it was. In, indeed, it was. He bet me a stick of licorice that he would get past the sentry and do it. And he got inside one of Farmer Giles's barrels and rolled past the soldier behind the magician. And then he got out and stood on the barrel and painted the statue because he knew the paint was there. And then he got back and rolled home. And now see what's happened to him. These sausages. He is not. The mayor pointed and there, peeping round the door, was the sharp nose of Dennis the Dachshund. The cry of joy, Larry rushed to his friend and flung his front hooves round his neck. Oh, Dennis, 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 where have you been? Oh, for a walk. I got tired of working that sausage machine, so I for a walk to Arkville went. Here I am. Oh, Dennis. Oh, a most affecting scene. <laughs> most affecting. Affecting it may be, Your Worship, but my duty's clear. This hound is the criminal we've been searching for. Oh, Mr. Mayor, sir, do forgive him. Remember, he might have been sausages. Well, I, I think in the circumstances we'll say nothing more about the statue affair, officer. After all, animals will be animals. Indeed. And I feel sure that it, uh, it will not occur again. Very good, Your Worship, if you say so. Dennis, my lad, you've had a lucky escape. Take yourself off. And if you mess about with paint again in a unlawful manner, I hope you do fall into the sausage machine. So? I will not do it again, I promise. And I also apologize to his worship for the excellent joke. Come, Larry, my friend, let us go. Uh, have you had your pocket money this week, was it? Oh, yes, Dennis. Would you like to ride to Arkville? No, my friend, but you owe me a stick of licorice, nicht wahr? Oh, bad. <laughs> Larry the Lamb and Dennis the Dachshund lived in Farmer Giles's barn, and both of them were supposed to work on the farm. But as a matter of fact, neither of them did any work to speak of. As the farmer was a kind-hearted man who liked to see young animals about him, he didn't worry them over much, and was content to allow them a little pocket money each week without asking too much in exchange. One morning, after a good breakfast, Larry and Dennis sat in the barn talking. I say, Dennis, I don't know how I can possibly manage any longer with only threepence a week pocket money. I always spend that before Tuesday. You see, I'm so awfully fond of lollipops. Mm -hmm. Not enough it is, Larry, my friend. My threepence goes almost before I can look at it. I told the farmer so. I said, after us living in your barn all this time, our pocket money to fourpence at least I think you ought to raise. And what did he say? He said, when I to do some work started, and when your wool long enough grew for him some off to cut and sell, uh -oh. he would think about it. So I told him I often worked. Only the day before yesterday, I had a stranger barn. Quite right, Dennis, and I expect my wool would grow much quicker if I had more pocket money. What I mean, you can't expect a lamb to grow wool on only three penny worth of lollipops a week. But I have been thinking, Larry, and an idea most excellent I have. You know Mr. Peter Brass? What? 
Peter Brass the pirate. I believe he once a pirate was, but he's been all sorts of things. Now a plumber he is being... Oh, what's that? A plumber is a man who pipes and sings men's, and when he calls himself a decorator, he paints as well. Mr. Brass the decorator is too, and he a very pretty notice board has with families waited on daily written on it. Well, I too, Mr. Brass, was talking yesterday, and he told me he wants two assistants to help him plumb and paint, because he's going to do Mr. Grouse's house. Uh -oh. And he said if you and I liked, we could help. I, a plumber, could be, and you, a mate, could be. But, but, but I thought a mate was a man in a ship. That another sort of mate is. It's very dangerous being a mate in a ship, because round you may get... But a plumber's mate cannot get drowned unless he into a cistern falls. Well, I, I can paint very nicely, but I don't think I could plumb. Yes, you could. Anyone can plumb. It's very easy. All you want is a lot of spinners and hammers and things and some black grease on your face and pores to rub to make yourself look workmanlike. And you melt solder over a little fire and pour it onto pipes and things. It's splendid fun. Well, I don't mind trying. I'm always willing to try. But I don't think I should ever be a really good plum mate. And I hate getting my fleece dirty. But we each at least six pence a week should get. Mr. Brass said so. And I don't mind rubbing myself all over with black grease for six pence a week. It's worth it, was it? Daddy felt very doubtful about Dennis's splendid idea. But he allowed himself to be persuaded. And presently both animals set out for the shop of Mr. Brass. They found that gentleman nailing up his new signboard. But when Dennis and Larry tried to attract his attention, he climbed down and listened to what Dennis had to say. Ah, oh, so you want to be plumbers, do you? Well, I always did believe in young animals learning a good trade, and you've come to the right place for learning plumbing, me lads. Have you ever done any work? Oh, yes, sir. I used to work on Mr. Giles's farm. I had to bah, to frighten naughty birds away from his corn, and I helped the magician, too, only he said I was too clever for him. So I had to go back to the farm. And now Mr. Dyers has put up a scarecrow to frighten the birds, so I haven't done much work lately. My friend Dennis is a watchdog by trade. He's awfully clever. Oh, yeah. Mm. Well, I don't mind giving you both a chance. I dare say you'll soon pick things up. And there's some very important work just coming. You can start at once. Mr. Grasser wants his house painted and some pipes many. Dennis, you can go around and look at the job. It's always a good plan to look at a job first. What must I do here, Brass? Oh, just look at it. Look at it? Yeah. When you look long enough, come back and tell me. Larry, you yeah. can come with me to the town hall and mend the mayor's bath. He says it leaks. <laughs> I don't suppose he knows what he's talking about, but we may as well go and have a look. I'll wheel the better with the tools, and you can make a little fire in that pail and bring it with you. You'll find some wood and coal somewhere about, and I'll lend you an apron so that you look more like a plumber. There's nothing like going out to a job all ship shape and proper. The mayor of Toy Town was seated in his study at the town hall when his secretary bustled in. Oh, your Worship, the plumbers have arrived. Uh, the plumbers? Uh, yes. The plumbers? Yes. What Want. Well, you ordered me to fetch a plumber to look at your bath. You said it was leaking. So I sent round to Brass and Co. Families waited on daily, and they have arrived. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I remember now you mentioned it. Uh, the bath does leak. I, I noticed it this morning distinctly. Someone has been dancing in that bath. Dancing in that bath. Probably with boots on. Anyone can see that? Well, do you know anything about it? No, oh, I, your worship. Oh, certainly not. No. I shouldn't dream of dancing in your bath or even paddling in it without your permission. Uh, well, I have my suspicions. If it wasn't you, it must have been Ernest the policeman. However, I kindly see that it doesn't happen again. Very well, yes, Your Worship. Admit these plumbers. The secretary went to the door and beckoned, and into the room stepped Peter Brass, carrying a bag of rattling tools, followed by Ladder the Lamb with a pail of hot coals, which he placed on the carpet. Good morning, Your Worship. I seem to know your face, uh, Brass. Uh, Brass. Brass. Uh, ah, ah, now I have it. You used to be a pirate. Uh, what are you doing dressed up as a plumber? Uh, it's true, Your Worship. I was a pirate once before I knew any better. 
but I've reformed. I'm glad to hear it, Brass. I'm glad to hear it. And what's that lamb doing here? If you please, Mr. Bear, I'm the pirate's mate. Oh, yeah. What? I, I mean, the, the plumber's mate. I've decided to learn to be a plumber. My friend Dennis is being a plumber too bad. You see, our little consciences have been worrying us. We thought it wasn't right for us to be doing nothing. It seems so lazy, so we decided to do some work. Ah, a very proper spirit, very praiseworthy. <laughs> what is that smell of burning? Oh, oh, so I expect that's my pail. I just laid it on the floor because it's rather hot to hold. Yeah, mind what you're doing, laddie, my lad. You'll be burning the gentleman's carpet if you ain't careful. My carpet? He's burnt a great hole in it. I can see it from here. Oh, that'll be all right, sir. <laughs> when he's had a good brush. <laughs> I'd better put my pail on the table. No, no, certainly not. I won't have it. Coming in here and lighting fires on my furniture, it's most inconvenient and uh, unseemly. Oh, you please, sir. I'm sorry, but I can't hold it for long because my little arms are very short and I had to hug the pail tight and it scorches my little tummy. we would put it in the fireplace. Put it in the fireplace! Why do you want to bring a fire with you? Oh, if you please, sir, uh, it's to boil our tea on and also to melt the solder. But I don't want you to melt solder. I want you to melt the... Uh, to mend the bath. <laughs> you can't mend a bath without solder, Your Worship. Very useful stuff, solder. Oh, please say it's awful fun too, melting solder. It goes all runny like treacle. Would you like me to melt some? Certainly not. It won't take a minute, sir. Never mind the solder, my lad. The gentleman doesn't want to see it. We come round here to put him in the bath. Where is this bath, sir? It's in the bathroom. If you will step this way, I will show you. Then the mare jumped, for with a loud clatter, Brass shot a heap of tools from his bag onto the table. No! Here you are, Larry, my lad. Choose yourself an hammer, a good heavy one. We're going to mend the gentleman's bath. The two plumbers followed the mare to the bathroom where the mare pointed to a hole in the bath. Larry stood on the tips of his hoofs and just managed to peer over the edge. Oh, that's a job that wants a bit of doing, that is. It's lucky you called us in. That bath will start leaking if you're not careful. Start leaking? But it does leak, and that's why I want you to mend the hole. Ah, but what I want to know is, is it the hole that leaks, Your Worship? You see, when you want to let the water away, you pull out that plug and the water runs away through that pipe. Leastways, it should do. It makes a funny, gurgly noise, like my friend Dennis when he's being tickled. Don't interrupt, Larry, my lad. Oh, this job wants thinking out. It's no good rushing at a job of this sort. As I was about to say, Your Worship, if that pipe is stopped up, the water can't run down it. I suppose you haven't been sailing boats in your bath by chance to all silly Lloyd frogs or anything of that sort? No, <laughs> certainly not. I only ask because a silly Lloyd frog or a toy boat will stop up a pipe before you know where you are. And then, of course, the water can't run down it, so it leaks away through the nearest hole. Because why, you'll say? Will it? Because if water can't run through one hole, it'll run through another. But it always leaks. There's a puddle under this barge at this minute. Oh, it may seem so to you, sir, but then you see, uh, you're not a plumber. <laughs> a very good mayor, sir, if I may be permitted to say so. <laughs> but no plumber. <laughs> Come out from under that bar, Freddy, my lad. You'll get stuck, you silly boy. Oh, please, sir, there's a puddle here. I can see it. And there's a spider floating in it. How would it do if I melted some solder and poured it on the hole? That might stop it. Well, that seems quite a good idea. But you two plumbers are supposed to be executing this work, not I. And I must leave you to do the best you can without me, for I have to catch the Arkfield coach, and I can't possibly start without a good lunch. Going to Arkfield, are you, sir? Ah, oh, then you'll be wearing your gold chain and all, I expect. Of course, I shall wear my gold chain and my gold watch as well. Oh. I'm going to take tea with the mayor of Arkville. And it's necessary for me to look as dignified as possible. The mayor hurried out and they heard him ask his secretary whether a seat had been reserved for him in the coach. But you know how I hate travelling with my back to the horse. It was all I could get, Your Worship. I'm sorry. Oh, very well, but I don't know what things are coming to. Very I can Going to Arkville, is he? And where did his gold chain? <laughs> also his gold watch. <laughs> You stop here, lady, my lad, and get on with the job. I've just remembered I have a most important appointment. Uh, shall I pour solder in the bath, Mr. Brass? No, my lad, the job ain't as easy as that. 
What you've got to do is to find out where that pipe goes. You ought to be able to manage that and it'll be good practice for you. All you have to do is to tap away at the walls with your hammer until you find it. Where, where shall I start, sir? Well, best to start up here and work your way downstairs until you get into the study. You're sure to hit the pipe sooner or later. Oh, but please, sir, what shall I do with it when I found it? When you found it, my lad, you can go home, because I shall be busy for the rest of the day. I'll take the big hammer with me. I might want it. And with a sly look, Peter Brass hurried away, leaving Larry with his little hammer tap, tap, tapping at the wall. About an hour later, Larry the Lamb was working hard in the mayor's study, trying to find the pipe as had been ordered by Peter Brass. He knew it must be in the wall somewhere, and a trail of cracked plaster showed where he had passed down the stairs from the bathroom. He was a conscientious lamb and was doing his work thoroughly. And now he stood on the mantelpiece in the study, banging away with his hammer, and he rather thought from a gurgling noise in the wall that he had at last found the pipe he was searching for. But suddenly, when he was about to give an extra hard bang on the wall to make sure, he heard a scamper of paws and into the room rushed his friend Dennis, looking very excited and breathing heavily. Larry, Larry, come down quickly. I've something to tell you, something dreadful. Where's the mayor? Oh, he's just finishing his lunch. He's going to Arkville. Go, he must not. Oh, do come down. I cannot talk to you up there. Something dreadful is going to happen. We must think what to do. Larry hastily climbed down from the mantelpiece, bringing several china ornaments with him and dropping his hammer with a crash on a pot of fern. Oh, what is it? Larry, a crime to prevent we must. You know Mr. Brass sent me to look at Mr. Grouse's house. Uh, well, I went and looked, and when for a long time I had been looking, Mr. Grouse, his head out of the window put, and said he wouldn't have me staring at his house in that rude way, and that if I didn't move off, he would earn us a policeman sent. Oh, so I came away and went back to the shop to tell Mr. Brass. And when I got to the shop and inside went, I heard voices. Voices? Yes, voices, people talking uh -oh. in the room behind the shop. And I thought they sounded very mysterious voices, so I listened. Then I, on the floor, crawled and through the doorway peeped very cautiously. And who do you think I saw? Father Christmas. Father Christmas. No, certainly not. I saw Mr. Brass talking to a highwayman. And he and Mr. Brass were saying they were going to stop the Arkville coach and how splendid it would be. And the mayor, his gold chain would be wearing. Oh, this is direct. Oh, and the worst of it is that the mayor may think we help because he knows we are Mr. Brass's mates. Well, as soon as I heard, I ran as hard as I could to tell you so that we could decide what to do. Don't you think we ought the mayor and Ernest the policeman to tell? Oh, I, I, I shouldn't like to do that. I'm sure Mr. Ernest is rather suspicious of me already because he looked at me very strangely when he saw me walking along behind Mr. Brass this morning with my little pail. Besides, do you think it's quite right for us to tell tales about our master? Yeah, we did not know he a highwayman was when we started being his mates, but now we do know it is our duty to tell. Oh, I daren't, but I know what we must do. We must prevent Mr. Mayor from going to Arkville this afternoon. How can we do that? Well, I might hit him on the head with my little hammer. Then perhaps he would have such a headache, he'd stop at home. Mm, not tall enough, are you? You could not reach. I could if I stood on a chair. No, we must have some better way, Sink. Hush, here's the mayor. Sink hard. Larry scrambled up to the mantelpiece again and began banging on the wall with his hammer just as the mayor entered the study. Good gracious me, what's all this? What are you doing up there? What do you mean by knocking my walls about like that? Oh, uh, if you please, Miss, Mr. Mayor, sir, I, I, I'm looking for a pipe. But is that any excuse for knocking the plaster off the walls and jumping about on my tables and mantelpieces and... Uh, oh, why, I declare, you've 
broken my lovely little mud. <laughs> no, 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 that China one with a present from Arkville written on it. Oh, this is disgraceful. Oh, 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 but, but Mr. Mercer, I must find the water pipe. Mr. Broth told me to tap until I found the pipe. And Larry gave an extra hard bang. There was a gurgling sound, and then a long stream of water shot out to the wall and poured down upon the carpet. He's found it, sir! He's found oh, it! Oh, oh, Mr. Mayor, sir, the water's all coming out, and I can't stop it. The proper way to stop water from a pipe out coming is to stick your thumb in the oh, end. I haven't got a thumb, only little hooves of oh, Mr. Mayor, sir. Would you mind sticking your thumb into the end of this pipe to stop the water squirting out? My hoofs won't go in, and Dennis hasn't got a proper thumb, and I know his paws won't fit. If you'll be kind enough to do it, I'll run round to Mr. Brassy's shop and get help. Me? Are you suggesting that I, the mayor of Toy Town, should stand on a mantelpiece with my thumb stuffed into a water pipe? I'd never heard of such a thing. It'd be most unsuitable for a man in my position. Oh, please, sir, it will be only for a minute. If you don't, we'll all get dreadfully wet. Look, look how fast the water is coming out. But they, but they, I, 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 I'm just about to start for Arkville. I shall miss the coach. Oh, we shan't keep you a minute, sir. On our way to the shop, we can tell the coach driver to wait for you. If only my secretary were here, he'd be just the man to stuff his thumb into a pipe. He's such a useful secretary. But I've sent him to the Ark with a message. Oh, very well then, I suppose I must. But it's most unsuitable for a man in my position. Help me out. Do be quick. Run all the way. And all the way back. The mayor climbed onto the mantelpiece with some difficulty. And after getting his sleeves full of water, succeeded in stopping the pipe with his thumb. As soon as they saw he was safely in position, Larry and Dennis hurried away. A splendid idea of yours that was. We have the mayor from being robbed saved. He cannot very well catch the coach now, but to make quite sure, we will round to the square run and tell the coach driver not to wait because the mayor has been detained. <laughs> In the square, the usual crowd had collected to see the Arkville coach start, for this was one of the excitements of the day. The coach always left the square at 1.30, and at one minute to the half hour, Ernest the policeman would stroll into the square, putting on his white gloves, while the coachman and the guard climbed up into their places. As the half hour struck on the clock of the town hall, the guard would raise his long brass horn and blow a loud blast. Ernest would raise one white glove hand to stop all other traffic, the crowd would cheer, and the coach would rattle away over the cobblestones in the direction of the Arkfield Road. On this particular afternoon, Larry and Dennis ran into the square just as Ernest the policeman was buttoning his white gloves. Oh, 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 oh look, 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 Dennis, the coach is nearly full. They, they'll all get robbed. We must stop them somehow. You nearly ready, driver? Ready? Yes, of course I'm ready. But you can't go without the mayor. Quite impossible. Then we must give him a minute or two. A very punctual gentleman, the mayor. You won't keep us long. It's disgraceful keeping us waiting like this. He, the mayor of Toy Town, he ought to set a good example. He'll be here any minute now, sir. He ought to be ashamed of himself, and he won't have my seat when he does come. I was here fast. Why doesn't he ride in his own coach instead of keeping us hanging about here? His worship's private and personal coach is being painted. Oh, Extravagant. And I must ask you not to speak disrespectful like Mr. Grouse, sir. Or it'll be my painful duty to take your name and address. He ought to be ashamed, officer, and I don't care who knows it. Mr. Driver and Mr. Coachman, but Mr. Mayor can't go today. He... He is detained. You're not to wait for him. There, there. What did I tell you? Disgraceful. After keeping us hanging about like that, it ought not to be allowed. Uh, and, Mr. Driver, it doesn't seem a very nice afternoon for you to go at all. I'm sure it's going to rain. Uh, don't you think you ought to wait until tomorrow? It's sure to be a lovely day tomorrow. Yeah. What are you talking about? Rain? The driver ain't afraid of a drop of rain? Well, uh, well, you, Mr. Ernest, there are a lot of other reasons why the coach ought not to go today. 
Uh, last night I had an awful dream. Oh, indeed. I dreamed that the coach was held up by robbers and that everyone in it was robbed, and I was so frightened I fell out in my little manger. Your ear, what's all this? What do you mean be dropping all those hints and frightening everybody like this? The animal knows something. I can see it in his eye. He knows the coach is going to be robbed, and I wouldn't be surprised if he's one of the robbers. He ought to be ashamed. Oh, if you please, sir, please. No, no, my lamb, speak up. Have you any reason to suppose there's any jiggery-pokery going on? Remember, I'm the law. Don't you go trifling with me. If you know something and don't out with it, you'll find yourself in a very awkward fix, my lad. Uh, uh, please, Mr. Ernest, sir, I'm, I'm very suspicious, and so is my friend Dennis. Oh, yeah, yeah. You see, he heard two tough-looking men saying they were going to rob the coach, only we were afraid to say anything because one of the men was... Mr. Brass. Ah, indeed. You done well to speak up, my lad. Mr. Brass is in it, is he? <laughs> well, I know how to deal with Mr. Peter Brass. I dealt with Peter Brass afore. And where's me truncheon? Now, you, Mr. Grouse, sir, shift along a bit, please. Oh, really? Come along, sir. I'm going to take a ride in this coach, and I'd like to see the rubber that had rubbed this coach while I'm in it. Larry, my lad? <laughs> Walk out into the middle of the square and hold up the traffic while we start. And mind you don't get run over. Get up there, Daisy! Come on. The horn blew. <coughs> the whip cracked and the coach drove bravely out of the square. Late that evening, a party consisting of Ernest the policeman, Dad of the Lamb, the coach driver and Mr. Grouser entered the town hall, and finding no one about made its way to the mayor's study. The room was in darkness, and nothing could be heard but a mysterious gurgling and splashing. But when Ernest switched on the light, everyone jumped with astonishment. Oh, my son. Well, I never... There was the mayor of Toytown standing on the mantelpiece, looking very wet and uncomfortable, with one hand stuck into a large crack in the wall from which water was dripping. It was also dripping from his sleeve. Your Worship, we wanted to speak to you if you're not too busy. Busy, officer? Busy? I've been up here all this afternoon, I'd have you know. I see, and that is how you spend your time, sir. Gallivanting about on mantelpieces. No wonder the town is going to wreck and ruin. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, what's been going on here, Your Worship? What's all this smashing and breaking and all? Who's been banging the walls down? And what's that big hole in your new carpet? Oh, he's done it himself. It's his idea of amusement. <laughs> a man who'd leap about on mantelpieces would do anything. Disgraceful. Us? That, that, that creature, that, that lamb there, he's responsible for all this. He calls himself a plumber. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, sir, not a really proper plumber, only a mate. That, that, that wretched animal broke a water pipe with his nasty hammer and then persuaded me to insert my thumb into the aperture in order to stop the water. I've been here for hours and hours. I've had no tea, and I'm certain I shall catch cold. Rheumatics. That's what you get, your worship. Rheumatics, like what I got. Oh, please, Mr. Mayor, sir, I did it for your own good. My own good? Oh, it was to prevent you getting robbed, you see. I had heard that Mr. Brass and the highwayman were going to rob the coach. I knew you wouldn't like to lose your gold chain, and I thought this was the best way. The Hannibal evidently meant well, Your Worship. He admitted to me that he'd heard about the proposed robbery. Knowing me duty as I do, I immediately rode out to the Hartville Road and made the necessary arrest. At least I arrested one of them. The highwayman got away in his horse. But Peter Brass is now in the new prison. But, but, uh, didn't the animal tell you how I was situated? Oh, Please, sir, I forgot it was all so exciting. But I meant well. Well, in the circumstances, I suppose I ought to be grateful to you, my lamb. You certainly saved my gold chain of office and also my gold watch. But I wish you could have saved them in a more comfortable way. And it wasn't at all necessary for me to stop this pipe with my thumb. All we wanted was a cork. 
I've been thinking it out all the afternoon, and it occurred to me just before you came in. A cork. A cork! And if someone will kindly procure a cork, I shall be able to withdraw my thumb and descend to a more dignified night. Mr. Mayor, sir, I'm glad you feel grateful, because I did my little best. And if you want to reward me, I don't want a medal. A medal? No, I, I'd soon have a little bell on a ribbon to tie around my neck. A blue ribbon, please, as I'm a little boy lamb. And now, sir, would you like me to finish mending that hole in your bar? <laughs> <laughs> 